as I said earlier, I'm going to take a slightly different tack on this. And I hope that I'm going to introduce you to some research, research opportunities that um, can help us to inform better policy and practice, um, and also to, to, to integrate in a mo much more collaborative style what's happening in our inst institutions, our academic institutions, and in the department. Um, so the, my, the theme will be how research can rapidly inform policy and practice. And I spoke to you earlier on, on about um, uh, this statement about you know, how, how uh, important at a global level this whole aging demographic is. And this is what's been happening. This is what's been happening globally, year on year. This, these are the countries that have kept good data, good figures, and um, mostly Nordic countries since the 1800s. And there's an increase in lifespan by three months per year on average. This is continuing to increase, and believe it or not, it's because of better health care, better management of communicable diseases, better quality of life, and more informed societies with respect to health care. So I, we, we went through this, that a baby born uh, th this year will live uh, three months longer than the siblings. And this is just to give you a sense of the relative increase in um, older populations. So going forward, over the next 10 odd years, 15 years, this is the proportion globally of zero to 64 year olds, the, the increase in those populations. The 85, those 85 and more will increase by 150%. And in this country alone, we can expect an increase in that particular oldest old age group by about 70% over the next um, 15 years, which is massive. And this is the proportionate change in those over the age of 100, a fourfold increase. And as you can see from this uh, recent uh, graph, that Ireland is, is exactly this. And in fact, in some aspects in latter years, we've accelerated the proportion of people over the age of 65 relative to our population. So the Irish Longitudinal Study of Aging is a research study. It started in 2006 with four years of piloting to get it right, to be sure we had the right sample size, to answer correct, co correct questions and disaggregate the data, etc. Sponsored by Atlantic Philanthropies initially and um, then by the Department of Health and since by the Department of Health with whom we work very, very closely. And this gives you a representative mapping of where the participants in the study come from. The study is a longitudinal study, which means that the same people, participants, are visited every two years, are engaged every two years in the assessment so that we understand the process of getting older in Ireland. We invite people over the age of 50, 50 and above, and 60% of the sample is aged 50 to 65 because it's a representative population sample, and that's what our population is. And of course, it's nationally represented. And the, the participants that take part in the study um, have been um, uh, invited through a very rigorous process. So we used a geodirectory of randomly selected addresses according to population density. We cold called on 30,000 randomly selected addresses and invited people to take part in the study if there was somebody over the age of 50 in the home. So it's, it's a, it was an incredibly intense process to actually set the data set up, but a very rich data set. And the study represents one in 140 people over the age of 40 on the island of Ireland are taking part in the study. The sample size was 8,500 and continues to be almost that apart from deaths. The attrition rates are very, very low, 6% with each wave, remarkable by comparison with other, with other studies. And we, as I said, we repeat the assessments every two years, initially for a total of 10 years. But in most countries, these sorts of studies go on indefinitely. And there's a very close working relationship with policy and, and practice and, and uh, evaluation of implementation and the academic groups and others taking, um, conducting the studies. There are kind of two main elements to it. First of all, we go to someone's home and conduct an hour and a half face-to-face -face interview where we ascertain health issues, but also social and economic issues. It's a very detailed interview introduced 
for the first time in Ireland, we used a CAPI system, a computerized system. As you can see, I'm incredibly proficient at that. A computerized system in the home for the first, for the first time to, to accrue the data. And then participants are invited to, to come to one of two health centers in Cork or in Dublin, or to have a health assessment done in the home. So we have objective measures of health status in addition to subjective, self-reported measures of health status. And that's proved incredibly informative. And the health assessment piece takes about three hours. And we look at a number of, of, of different um, components, particularly um, BMI, body mass index, et cetera, mobility, lots of different mobility elements because falls and gait and balance, et cetera, it's so big as people get older. Brain function, lots of different, bo both mood, depression, anxiety, loneliness, social isolation, social participation, in addition to neuropsychological tests and tests for dementia, et cetera. Dental, we have dental assessments. We, 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 we look at the, the eyes, the ears, and other, visual, or other senses, um, the heart, very detailed cardiovascular, and bone. So we, we have a picture every two years of the experience of aging and that process and the early risk factors at wave one, which predicted now, six years later, outcomes such as stroke, uh, early Alzheimer's, etc. So the, the big picture of the experience of aging in Ireland and blood samples are taken so we know the true prevalence of diabetes as opposed to self-report, etc. A lot of issue, a lot of data also on health care utilization at each wave. The three big areas therefore covered are health in great detail, wealth, which very much influences health, and happiness. And the study is designed so it's comparable with other longitudinal studies internationally. The American study started in 1990, continues to this day, and is the main source of information for policymakers, both when developing new policy, but also in evaluating policy. Because think of it, you introduce a new policy, you have the implementation process, the practice change, one hopes, and then this sort of a study allows one to actually map the impact of that practice change or whether or not it has taken place. So I'm going to give you two examples of how to date the study has, has worked with uh, policy and possibly helped to inform policy. One of the examples is with respect to atrial fibrillation and the other is sort of environmental and work we're doing with the Department of Transport. So if we could have the video. Atrial fibrillation is a potentially fatal irregularity of the heart, where the heart beats rather than synchronously, irregularly. Um, it's, uh, this, this shows you the pattern from an electrocardiogram. That's the normal rhythm, which I hope everybody in the room has. And the, and the, the tracing below is the abnormal rhythm. And what happens is because of this, clots are thrown into the system. And those clots cause stroke, heart failure, and are one of the commonest modifiable causes of Alzheimer's disease. So we ask participants, has a doctor ever told you you have atrial fibrillation or an arrhythmia? We also collate information on all of the pharmacy, all of the medications that our participants are taking. Then we measure their rhythm in, at the health assessment stage. Remarkably, one in five men over 80 in Ireland have atrial fibrillation. So it's very common. One third of those who had atrial fibrillation didn't know they had the irregularity. A further third knew, but weren't on the correct treatment to stop stroke or heart disease. And only one third were aware that they had it and were on the right drugs. So we worked then with NGOs such as the Irish Heart Foundation and policymakers to, to inform a, an, a, a PR um, uh, process, but also worked with the HSE who did a very good uh, pilot study in the west of Ireland to see if uh, opportunistic screening in general practice would work for this, and indeed that led to a uh, policy uh, document, as you know now, on uh, healthcare, opportunistic healthcare screening in general practice for uh, atrial fibrillation. So we can go back to the main slides now. Thank you. So that just gives you some uh, sense of policy and practice, etc. I'll just skip on from that.
The next one I'm going to talk to you about is the work we're doing with the, the this is the um, recent HTA uh, document uh, which was informed by the atrial fibrillation work by TILDA and, and the HSE, of course. So, Department of Transport. We've been working with the Department of Transport and Dublin City Council on this whole issue of gate mobility and uh, friendly environments. Because, of course, um, uh, freedom to mobilize in your environment is really important as people get older for independent living. If you're afraid to go out and do your own shopping, then that's going to seriously impact on your independence. And there's lots of reasons why falls become so much more common as we get, as we get older. Um, you know, 40% of people over the age of 80 have recurrent falls in a year two or more falls in a year. The commonest cause of institutionalization, commonest cause of institutionalization in Europe is falling. Falls are much more common, of course, if you've got um, cog you know, cognitive impairment or early brain um, fa failure or dysfunction. And it's because muscle strength changes with aging, balance does, reaction times change, vision and hearing are impaired, fear of falling becomes much more common and there are other psychological and cognitive f factors which lead to falls, which are a major issue. The minimum required walking speed to cross the road is this, pretty much internationally and certainly in Ireland, 1.2 meters per second. One of the tests that we do in, in, in TILDA is a walking speed test. And we use it here under regular kind of conditions and then we challenge participants holding a glass of water or um, counting letters of the alphabet backwards, et cetera, et cetera, so that they've got a cognitive task. Because of course, when somebody's crossing the road, it isn't squeaky clean environment like this, but there will be noises, challenges, distractions as they're crossing. So we wanted to have some sense of walking speeds generally in, for different age groups in that context. And here you can see that for those over the age of 80, 60%, particularly of women, were not able to cross the road at the speed, the designated speed, of, of, from the time that the lights change amber to red, pretty much internationally, but certainly in Ireland, of 1.2 meters per second. And one in three people over the age of 65, their normal walking speed was significantly slower than this. Men and women, but more so in women. So this is really an important information for um, those of us engaged in policy uh, with respect to environment and age-friendly cities. And um, we, we've helped to, to work with the Dublin City Council and others in trying to craft some realistic options with respect to gate, speed, independent living, and these particular findings. So there are two examples of, of how uh, this study, which is a huge um, database and isn't, I, I mean, we're only tip of the iceberg in terms of the analyses, but how those, how those studies have helped to inform something very recently. I don't, I don't know if the two uh, ministers in the room are here. I can't quite work it out, but the environment will be very familiar to you. And Tilda has actually been cited 120, 100 and 213 times in um, uh, parliamentary proceedings uh, since it started. So it's actually, certainly the data is being used and the information that we publish is, is, is translating, I hope, into awareness and some practice. With respect to Healthy Ireland, we've worked with the Department of Health in mapping the quality indicators in Healthy Ireland and the information available in TILDA. TILDA covers 80% of the, um, those requirements for, for Healthy Ireland. Also, it's, um, we've helped to inform positive aging strategy, the national dementia strategy, um, the Dublin City um, Council um, um, strategy on, on age-friendly cities, etc. the HTA we've talked about, and, and recently volunteering amongst older people. So, so it's been a challenge um, for us to engage in a proactive way with policy. But it's actually um, also been a fantastic learning experience for us, and I think it's very fruitful with a lot more potential, and it's a good model. And what we've done now with our colleagues in the Department of Health is we have a, a, a fairly senior postdoc with health economic expertise straddling both sites. Now, I don't want you to be too visual in your imagination of that. Um, 
working within the Department of Health and within the, um, within the TILDA team so that we've got some sense of what the particular issues are in the department and we can be proactive in embedding those issues into the next round of questions for the next wave. But also the department, it's an iterative process, will understand better that we can actually respond rapidly to any issues that they may need um, quick responses to. So that model's working very well and we hope to be able to continue to develop that. And uniquely in Ireland, the data is publicly archived. It's archived in UCD and it's archived also in Michigan and we've had a lot of use of the data internationally which is good for a fu publicly funded process like this. It means international researchers are analyzing the data and as, as an investing body, the government and others who've invested in this are actually getting the maximum output from this very um, detailed process. So that's, qu that's quite unique amongst research communities who are inclined to covet um, the sort of work they're doing. So I'd just like to acknowledge the, the, uh, the organization, both of TILDA, the institutions that support it. We've got support from all of the major academic institutions in Ireland, including technical colleges, of course, the Atlantic Philanthropies and the Department of Health. And hope that this has given you some sense of how research, continued research, um, can help possibly to inform policy and practice in Ireland. Thank you.